Yeah, thank you, church, for a sweet time already this morning. I know the Lord is, is leading and moving us, moving among us and in us. Because um, the title of my message, well, it's not the title, but the content of my message is about joy. And both Matt and Reese talked about joy, except I've titled it this way. <laughs> Don't forget to laugh out loud. Um, before I go there, however, um, I just want to say this very briefly. I, I won't take too much time on it, but I, I think for those of you that don't know, some of you may not, especially those of you who have come here in the last few years, Sarah Esh is a big reason why so many of us are here. Um, not me personally, but many others. She was the first as far as I understand, among that family that came to know the Lord and then John after that. And the result is what we see here in their family, their, their children, the second and third generation. And uh, it's good that we took time today to pray for her, recognizing the generation that's gone ahead of us. And even though, you know, and you know Sarah, you've seen her sit up here faithfully with a wonderful a blessed spirit about her and if you spent even a little bit of time with her you know that and that's why it touches us so much and uh, as much as I know she wants to see the Lord uh, the selfish part of me says no not yet Sarah we, we want more of you we want to receive the blessing that we've got from you for so many years and I think it, the blessing we are receiving comes from even long before that and sometime if I hope she writes a book of her testimony of how she came and trusted the Lord in the midst of a, a community that despised her for it and took a stand and patiently waited for her husband also to trust the Lord the same way. So we'll, uh, someday maybe she'll get to write that story yet, God willing. I also wanted to say that I, I've been thinking about this, that there are two ministries of the Word of God that I see and um, one is this verse that you know well in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now I think it's a pity that the word used here is sword. Um, and I, I say that carefully, not, not like I'm questioning the translation or anything like that. But if you read the whole verse in its entirety, the understanding I get, and the, the revelation I get from this verse is it's a kind of a sword that's able to make a very fine division. So it's not like a broad sword that you just swing around and slash people with. And unfortunately, some people use the written word of God that way to cause a lot of damage. However, the understanding I have here about the word of God is it's like a surgeon's scalpel, which is an extremely sharp knife. I think it's probably sharper than your average sword, in fact, because it's got to go and ensure that it cuts exactly where it should cut and nowhere else. It can't be a sword that's trying to kill and just doesn't matter where the, the skin and the body is torn open because the intent is to kill with the sword. It's a scalpel where the intent is actually life. It's the kind of knife that brings life. It's the kind of knife that cuts in, cuts in to divide, like he says, the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. I mean, we're talking about, you know, think about, if I just take my finger as an example, there are both joints and marrow in here. And if I wanted to divide between that and to discern between joints and marrow and cut something in there because of some infection that's going on in there, I can't bring my broad sword to it. I need a surgeon's scalpel that can go in and cut very delicately. It's sharp. It's extremely sharp. Like I said, sharper than your average sword because it must be so fine. And that's one ministry of the Word of God is this cutting this removal of that which is infected sin the word of God goes in and divides that not only 
what we think of as outward sin, say the Ten Commandments and those things that the world even maybe considers as bad. But the soul and the spirit, able to discern whether this good thing I'm about to do is based in my soul or based in my spirit. Because if it's based in my soul, it is just as good as sin from God's perspective. And so I need this fine scalpel that goes in and says, hey Santosh, yeah, in a, in a courtroom of law, you can stand and say what I did was right. But on the, in the courtroom of the Word of God, which is this sharp scalpel, your action and your motive and your attitude doesn't stand up. Let me cut it away. There must be that cutting away of things that are sinful, that are unchristlike, as a result of the Word of God. Now, if that's the only ministry of the Word of God, I think we would be a, uh, an imbalanced church. If a surgeon only goes in and cuts away that which is infected and leaves the wound gaping, that person will probably die. What must happen after that is the closing up, is the balm and the ointment. I think of um, Isaiah 55 on the other side as a balance of the ministry of the Word of God. And especially I'm thinking of preaching and teaching. In, our, uh, in the preaching and teaching that Phil and I do, but even in your sharing, the Bible studies, women's Bible studies, there's this balance of the ministry of the Word of God. And it says here in Isaiah 55 verse 11, well, verse 10 actually, Isaiah 55 verse 10, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So this is, I see the other side of the ministry of the word of God where after the surgeon has gone in, cut, and separated and cut out and removed that which is sinful, that which is a hindrance to the body, whether it's to you personally or to the body of Christ as a whole, then the Word of God must also come in and like a bomb and like rain and snow, bring healing, bring life back, create an atmosphere, create an environment where growth can now happen, where the wounds are closed up and the ointment is applied and uh, antibiotics are kicking in and, and the body is now allowed rest and healing. This is the balanced ministry of the Word of God. And I want you to know, I believe this is Phil's heart as well, that our goal and our sincere desire is for that ministry to be balanced in this church. It may not be balanced in each of us individually because there is no perfectly balanced person. That's the only per perfectly balanced person is Jesus Christ, which is why He is the first body of Christ. And none of us individually is now called another body of Christ. Collectively, with our imbalances, we are put together and united into one body of Christ. So, the reason I'm saying this as a preface, and the reason the Lord laid it on my heart to share with you is, you will find in your own heart that there will be imbalances. That there are certain tendencies that you may have, certain ways, Now I'm not talking about sinful things, things that the Holy Spirit convicts you about which are sinful and unchristlike. But I'm talking about that necessary thing that you may have an uh, emphasis on, or a tendency towards that's not necessarily unchristlike. Don't necessarily feel like you have to correct that and be somebody who God has not intended you to be. Seek to be balanced in all things as the Lord gives you light, but recognize that there is a balance of the entire body of Christ that will only come through somebody else. That's why we need the body of Christ. That's why we need each other. We need each other so we can learn from each other, but also so that there is a right hand and a left hand, a right foot and a left foot. And you know that there are certain designs of this hand, this arm, for example, that are the mirror image of this arm. And if the right arm says, you know what, I'm tired of, being, of always leaning this way, I'm going to try to be like my left arm, try to imitate and copy that other brother whose tendency is a little bit on the other side. And that would be a very awkward way of living life if I try to go around like this because I think I need to be more left-handed. If the Lord has called you to be a right hand, be a right hand. <laughs> The Lord's called you to be a right toe, be a right toe, big toe or little toe, whatever it might be. 
And what that can do for us is to give us a security in the body of Christ. Now, again, please understand, we can take this to an extreme. We'll say, well, this is my personality. This is how I am. I'm never going to change. These are my quirks. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the ministry. I'm talking about the function for, for which God has placed you in the body of Christ. Don't, you don't have to covet somebody else's ministry. You can be content in the ministry that God has given you. If you have a clear vision of it, if you have a purpose set before you, Lord, I want to know why you've placed me in this body. What is the purpose for it? And I want to fulfill that with all of my heart without trying to copy somebody else's ministry. So recognize there's that balance in the body of Christ. Now, um, in Matthew chapter 8, um, you don't have to turn there, but if you'll notice... After, I, the last time I spoke, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about discerning the ministry of the true Jesus and how we discern this from all the other false Jesuses. There are another Jesuses that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 11. In the world already today, John said, that's there. Antichrists that look like Christ. See, the thing about Antichrist is he doesn't look like the other religions. He looks like Jesus. That's why he's called the Antichrist. He's not anti any other religion. He's the Antichrist because he's the opposite of Jesus in spirit, but very similar in language and appearance. And we must recognize and be able to discern these other Jesuses, these other spirits from the true Jesus. After we see uh, the passage in which I stopped where uh, in Matthew 8 verse 18, he then goes on to talk about discipleship. And one of the last things I said in my message two weeks ago was that the main purpose of Jesus' earthly ministry was to make disciples. It wasn't just to cast out the demons. It wasn't just to open the eyes of the blind and open the ears of the, the deaf and make the lame walk. Yes, he did all of those things. But his purpose in that was to bring the kingdom of heaven down to this earth. And the kingdom of heaven does these things. It's manifest in power where it has authority over the devil and power over sickness and power to heal, just like we've been praying this morning. Power to heal. But the purpose of that, the underlying purpose of that is to make every man or woman or child disciples of Jesus. And I say, you know, for example, when you see Peter's mother-in-law, after she was healed, she got up and waited on Jesus. She was there to serve him. I don't know if she, maybe she was a disciple of Jesus in her heart and continued to follow the Lord. So Jesus' purpose, even in answering our prayer, whether it's physical healing, material blessing, if you're in financial need and you say, Lord, I want you to help me in this financial need. The reason we ask for that is, Lord, I want to be your disciple. If you're really asking for an answer to prayer in some earthly area with the underlying motive that the bottom line is, Lord, I want to be the most wholehearted disciple of yours on this earth, then you know that the Lord can answer that prayer according to His will because He knows it will not hinder you from being His disciple. And I was going to go on and talk about discipleship, but the Lord just directed me a different way in the last couple of days. And again, it's interesting. I don't know how the Lord will lead this, given that this is a time of uncertainty for some of us in this family, for all of us as a church. But even as we pray for Sarah and are uncertain about her future or how much longer we'll have with her, but the Lord impressed it on my heart to speak about joy. And I believe that this is so important for us to understand because without joy, we will miss the essence of discipleship. Without joy, without that happiness that Reese spoke about, without that understanding of God as being supremely full of joy, we will find a means and a way of discipleship that will lead us into bondage. And I say that as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of confession as well. That for years I pursued, many years in the past, I pursued a discipleship that was not based on joy. And it led me into bondage. It led me into legalism. It led me into judgmentalism of others. See, I believe Phariseeism and judgmentalism comes from this. That I'm doing something out of a sense of obligation. I don't really enjoy doing it. There isn't any joy in it. And I really feel like I'm, I hate the fact that I have to live this way. And then I see somebody else who is not living this way and calls himself a Christian. And then all of a sudden I'm worked up about it. How dare he enjoy that? How dare he have a television? How dare he play sports when I've been told that I can't? And then this 
festering comes in and this irritation and leads to bondage. Every act of discipleship, the way of discipleship is a way of joy. That's the essence of what I'd like to convey to you today. So, uh, on that, uh, that slide, focus on the joy. You know, I wonder, you know, as I read the account of where Jesus called the disciples, he called Peter and Andrew when they were fishing with their dad. I think he was with their dad. Certainly James and John were with their father. He called Matthew when he was sitting at his work desk. And the response that you got from them was that they dropped their nets and followed him. I mean, imagine if you were sitting in your work desk one day, and Jesus actually came, and you just dropped it and left. And this isn't just working for a boss. This is working with your father. This is the family business that you've been trained. You've been reared from your youngest age to take over. Mr., you know, his name was Jonah. If, if, Simon, if Peter's, Peter's father would likely have been called Jonah if his name was Bar-Jonah. So Mr. Jonah is raising Peter and Andrew, Simon and Andrew, to take over his fishing business. And along comes Jesus. And Simon, Peter, and Andrew just say, yep, Lord, I'll follow you. And what I see in them is an excitement and a joy of this call to discipleship that I see lacking in some of the calls to discipleship in Christendom today. I found lacking in my own life as well. Not that the message was communicated to me wrong. I don't think. I don't fault the preachers because I listen to some of those preachers now. But I interpreted it wrong. I allowed the devil to twist this call of discipleship where Jesus came to me and said, come, follow me, in the same way that he did to James and John and Peter and Andrew. And somehow it just became, all right, Lord, I'll do it. Okay. I want to go to heaven. I want, I want to be a disciple. I guess I should do it. I kind of shrugged my shoulders and picked up this wearisome cross and said, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. You know, I've started to see it in a much different light. I see Jesus coming to Peter and Andrew and James and John and Matthew and all those other disciples and saying, hey, I want you to be on my team. You know, this is Super Bowl Sunday. I was trying not to use a Super Bowl analogy, but I'm going to have to. I'm sorry. Uh, bear with me for those of you that, that don't, can't stand it. But imagine if one of these teams, the, the Broncos, let's say, that was playing in, in, in uh, the, the game later this afternoon, needed one more player. And there was this person who's been wanting to make the cut all along and hasn't been able to. He's always just not on the roster. And the day before the big game, they say, hey, we want you. We need you to be on our team. We need one more player. We need somebody whose gift is this. And guess what? We're going to win. And you're going to get a ring. And you'll get paid and all that stuff. Could you imagine the excitement that this player would feel? You mean me? You mean really? You, I could get to be on the team? This is the call that Jesus is giving us. His team is going to win. And he offers you, he offers us this call of discipleship and says, do you want to be on my team? You remember how in the schoolyards back, I don't know if you guys did it here, probably did, but in India it was like that. You know, they pick teams and you always hope, I don't want to be the last guy picked. And, and if you were picked early, you thought, wow, he likes me. He thinks I'm a good player. I'm going to get picked. That's the mentality I see in Peter and Andrew. where They said, you mean Jesus, you want me? To take up your cross, to take up my cross and follow you? Yes, Lord. That's the spirit of joy. That's the spirit that Christ wants to communicate to us and transfer to us. Where we hear his call now day by day and he says, come follow me. And I say, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm excited to do this because I'm starting to taste of your joy. You know, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. It's important for us to understand what this word disciple means. We don't see it lived out as much today. We don't have this concept of masters and disciples like they did in Jesus' day where they would have understood exactly what it meant when he said, I want you to be my disciple. But let me summarize it like this, that a disciple's job was to fix his or her eyes on the master and look at what the master is doing, how the master is living his life, and live the same way. That's why they called him rabbi. Rabbis had students who looked up to the rabbi and if they, if they noticed the rabbi was reading from Isaiah today, guess what? They're going to read from Isaiah today because that's what rabbi is doing. And this was that master discipleship relationship that Jesus was now saying, now I'm going to teach you how to learn from me. Like he says in Matthew 11, take my yoke upon you, look at me, how I'm doing it, and be my disciple. 
in Hebrews chapter 12, we're, talked about, we're told how to run this race of discipleship. And I saw something in the last couple of days that I hadn't really noticed before that I want to share with you today. And that's here where it says in the end of verse 1, Hebrews 12 verse 1, he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is the race of discipleship. This is the race that we're all on to be fully conformed into the image of Jesus. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And as you know, endurance is a difficult thing. It's like trying to run a marathon. I mean, don't, it's not for the faint of heart. You got to keep doing it. You got to keep, you got to have that mental willpower, as it were, to run a marathon. And there must be that spiritual willpower to run this marathon race that we're on. That's what he's talking about. And so how do I get this spiritual willpower that no matter how long it takes, no matter how much suffering I must go through, no matter how I feel physically or emotionally, I'm going to press through until I am fully confirmed into the image of Jesus. How do I do that? He tells us in verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. This is the disciple fixing his eyes on the master. How did Jesus do it? Jesus proved that you can come down to this earth as a human being, be tempted in all of these areas that we are tempted in, because it says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet never sinned, and he made it all the way from start to finish without ever sinning. And now he says, listen, look to me and you too will be able to endure until the end. You too, despite the fact that you may have made, have made mistakes, have sinned, have made a mess of your life, you too, if you see today as the day of salvation and have faith, you too can endure until the end and be like me in nature. So, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. He is the one who started and ended faith, ends faith. But look at how he ran the race. How was he, if I could use this term, a disciple of his father? See, Jesus exemplified discipleship for us as well. He didn't have an earthly disciple. He was the disciple of his father. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of my master who sent me, which was his father, to do the will of the father. So Jesus had that master, if you will, that rabbi, if you will, which was the father. And in that, he was an example for us where he says, I'm just looking to the father. And he endured until the end. And now he says, now you look to me. If you have seen me, you have seen the father, he told Philip in John 14. And so we're fixing our eyes on Jesus. And that next phrase that I have I glossed over for so many years, Open my eyes to something new about how we're called to endure this race. How did Jesus endure this race? He had a joy that was set before him. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He didn't look at the cross and think, all right, I'll take up this cross, Father, if you ask me to. No, his eyes were fixed on the joy. It didn't matter if the Father plunked a cross on his shoulders because he was looking at the joy. And this... My dear brothers and sisters, I believe is the secret to us going through life without complaining, without looking at the dreariness of the circumstances God might ask us to go through, through the pain and the suffering and the anxiety and the doubt and the uncertainty. What are your eyes fixed on? Are they fixed on the joy? Let me show you another verse in Matthew 13. I think we referred to this parable recently in one of our studies. Matthew chapter 13. It's a very short parable, one verse, Matthew 13, verse 44, but it's a powerful parable nonetheless. It says that the kingdom of heaven, which again is another phrase for describing, describing this way of discipleship, this following of Jesus, this being a part of his work. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again and he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, for many years, that's how my Bible read. Let me read it that way again so you understand what I'm omitting. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And so he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Children, if you're paying attention, what phrase did I leave out? Or young people, somebody tell me. What did I leave out? Okay, adults, tell, help me out. From joy over it. 
You see why he was so willing to give up? I mean, he, maybe he was a millionaire. Maybe he was a very rich man. Um, he already had quite a bit. But he didn't even think twice about giving up all of that. Because he had a joy. A joy over finding this pearl of great price. He says, you know what? I found it and I'm so excited about this pearl of great price that you can take my whole house. I mean, take my land, take my savings and everything. I have found the pearl of great price. This is discipleship. From joy over it, he says, I'll give up everything. And I realized as I looked back on my life that the reason I was so reluctant, so stingy about giving up. You mean, Lord, I got to give that up too? You're asking me for something else? What, what else are you going to ask me for next? I realized I hadn't seen the pearl of great price. I didn't have that joy. And when my eyes, as my eyes are starting to be opened to the pearl of great price, which is Jesus himself, one pure and holy passion for Jesus himself, I'm starting to taste of that joy. And now when the Lord asks me to give up something else, I says, Lord, yes, because I found the pearl of great price. Just don't take Jesus from me. Don't take anything else of your divine nature from me. Don't take Jesus from me, Lord. You can take everything else because I have this joy from joy over it. He sells everything that he has. This is the disciple following in the master's footsteps. So that last phrase I have on there in red, follow Jesus in focusing on the joy. Remember this, church. Let's remember this. I'm trying to speak that as an encouragement to my own heart even now. Follow Jesus, focusing on the joy. He did that, and he proved that's the only way you'll make it to the end. If we are to endure until the end, which Matthew 24 says, only those who endure to the end will be saved. The only way we'll make it is if we're imitating Jesus in this. Focus on the joy. Focus on the joy. I want to show you a picture on that next slide. <laughs> um, I like this, this phrase. I think it's a good phrase for us to remember as Christians. Laugh until your belly hurts and then just a bit more. I wonder, as, as you've meditated on your Heavenly Father and your example, Jesus Christ, has it brought forth a laughter in your heart? Has it brought forth a just a rejoicing, a smile on your face? You know, the countenance reflects a lot of things. In, uh, in Genesis... For when God speaks to Abel, he says, your countenance has fallen. I see that there's, a, there's something that, that I can see on your face that betrays something in your heart. Let's smile more. <laughs> That's essentially what I'm trying to say. Let's laugh more. Let's learn to enjoy this journey we're on. Now, I don't want to speak theory. I don't want to speak, I, you know, we, I, I think it's good that we're talking about this on a Sunday when we're experiencing some level of pain. And we all walk through different experiences of pain from week to week and uncertainty. But in the midst of that, let's have our eyes fixed on the joy. If you fix your eyes on the sickness and you fix your eyes on what's going to happen tomorrow and fix your eyes on will that bill get paid and fix your eyes on that other thing, you will give up. Most likely, you won't make it until the end. But if your eye is fixed on the joy, you know what happens? That joy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Where the, it's just like God can now put more on you. God can now allow you to go through a deeper trial, a deeper situation of testing, because He sees that you've got your eyes fixed on the joy. And He tells the devil, devil, go ahead. And put some more on his back. Put some more on her back. Why? Because I know he, she's got their eye fixed on the joy and I can put more trouble on them. I can put more try. I can allow more trial to come into their life and they will endure through it. I hope this is a word of comfort for you, especially wives, mothers. Some of you go through very difficult pains in, in pregnancy and pains in your body. Uh, all of us go through different f circumstances. And I was just talking with Zach and Ashley about how the pains and, and trials we go through in our body as men doesn't compare <laughs> to what you women go through and the sicknesses you go through. But you bear it well. And, and, uh, and all of you, I hear different circumstances that you're going through, trials that you're going through, and I see that you're bearing it well. Keep your head up. Keep your smile bright. Keep your countenance cheerful as you are doing. And we keep your eyes fixed on the joy and we will make it. I wanted to show you a few reasons for why we should rejoice. Um, and I'm sure you know all of these things already. But I thought I'd remind you again. 
as, as we look at it to, together as a church, why is it that we can truly rejoice? First of all, rejoice because you are God's inheritance. In Romans 8, he, he, he says, Romans 8, Romans 8 verse 31, a verse that you must know. It comes a few verses after the verse that you know well that says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Romans 8 verse 28. Having said that and having seen in verse 29 that His purpose, His destination for us that He has predetermined is that we should be conformed into the image of His Son Jesus. And so maybe you're at a place in your life where you realize, okay Lord, I, I'm willing to accept by faith that you're going to work all things together for good because I love you and I'm called according to your purpose and I put my faith in Romans 8, 29 that you're going to conform me to the image of your Son Jesus. But now what? Now we need verse 31 which says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Paul hearkens to the fact that the Father sent down Jesus, which was his only his only begotten Son, we read in John 3, verse 16. He had and only, this God who owned the cattle on a thousand hills and has need of nothing, had and only, which was the Son, the Son Jesus, fully God. And He sent Him down here to this earth and gave Him up freely. And Paul says, when you look back and see that your Father was willing to give up that only that He had, now, how much more will He not freely give you all things? How much more will He not freely give you all things? This is the confidence with which we can go to God and ask Him by faith. Say, Father, you've already given me Jesus. I know that you're on my side. And you proved it when you allowed your Son to come down to this earth and suffer as a human being and hang on the cross and suffer to the death of a criminal. You allowed it to happen for my sake. I see your love for me, Father, now. Knowing that you love me so much, here I am in need. Here I am going through this trial. Here I am going through this moment of uncertainty and doubt and perplexment where I don't know what's going to happen. Help me, Father. And I come to you on the basis of Romans 8.32 where you gave me freely your son. How much more will you not freely give me that which I need? You have an inheritance. Son of God, daughter of God, rejoice. Zechariah 2 verse 8. You can write down that reference. But he who, it says, he who touches you touches the apple of my eye, God says. Is somebody trying to harm you? Is somebody trying to take advantage of you? Is the devil trying to oppress you through sickness or through temptation or through trial? Guess what he's doing? The devil is messing with the apple of God's own eye. That enemy of yours on this earth that's trying to make life miserable for you does not realize it, but he is messing with the apple of God's eye. Now, if somebody came to you and tried to mess with the apple of your eye, which is this, the pupil, what would you do? I mean, even if a little mosquito comes near the apple of your eye, you're just going to whack it away. Get rid of it. Get out of here. Don't mess with the apple of my eye. That's my sensitive spot. And God says... Anyone who touches you to harm you is messing with the apple of my eye. You think I would allow the apple of my eye to go neglected? Do you think your father, our God who sits on high, he uses earthly language. You know, he doesn't have an eye like we think of, like we have eyes. But he says, I, want, I wish you could see that even though it seems like I might have forgotten you, even though it seems like I'm silent in this trial and you haven't heard from me in a while and you don't know and you're begging me for an answer, but it doesn't seem to come, I want you to know. You're not forgotten because you're the apple of my eye. And no person can neglect the apple of his, of his own eye or her own eye. He treasures you like the apple of his eye. In Ephesians chapter 1, I think I've mentioned this verse here before. It's very good for us to see it again though. Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? Read that carefully. The wording is so important. What is the riches of the glory? Riches of the glory. Riches of the glory. I wish I could say that all day long. Riches of the glory of what? Paul, of what, Holy Spirit? His inheritance, which is the inheritance of God. 
Not my inheritance. My inheritance you'll read in verse 11. We have obtained an inheritance. That's verse 11. Now he's talking about the inheritance that God has obtained. Have you thought about this? That the God who needs nothing, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, has an inheritance in the saints. In you, child of God, in you, son of God, in you, daughter of God. If you're a newborn believer that has made a mess of your life up to this point, and today morning you decided with all of your heart that you were going to follow Jesus, you know what the Father is saying in heaven today? I'm richer today because of that son of mine, that daughter of mine that has come back home. Read again Luke chapter 15 and see how the Father's heart got enriched. This was a rich man, the father of the prodigal son. He was a rich man. He didn't need anything more. It's a picture of our Father in heaven who really doesn't need anything more. But when the son who was lost comes back, oh, he throws a party like he's never thrown one before. Why? Because he's been enriched. Now, it's hard for us to understand this inheritance and God getting richer because you think, well, Lord, how can I make you rich? How can me, who was a wretch and a horrible, sinful man when you picked me up from the gutter and now you've cleaned me up and made me holy and sanctified me and made me one of your saints, how am I going to make you rich? The closest example I can give you to that is as a father, when my children were born into my family, did I spend more money on them? Yes. Now, before that, it was just me, and then it was me and Megan, and then, then we started to have children. And they draw from my resources, but I consider myself richer because I have them, because they're in my life. And this is the, the best I can see on this earth of what it means when our Father says, have you come back in repentance to me? There is great joy in heaven over one sinner in re who repents. There is an enrichment that happens in heaven that hadn't happened before you came to God. Did you know that? Now, this doesn't mean that we puff up our shoulders and think, oh, yeah, I'm an important person in the kingdom of God. No, it just causes me to fall on my face and say, wow, God, would you really love me that much that you would call yourself rich and make me feel so precious and so valuable in, in your eyes that you say, I'm a rich man, Santosh, the God of the universe, the king of kings who needs nothing, calls himself a richer man because of me. I don't say that proudly. Please understand. I want to say this in such a way that you say it in your own heart as well. That you know that if you are a child of God, you're a son or daughter of His, He is richer because of you. The richness, how does He say it? The riches of the glory of His inheritance. This is all the work of God. I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing to make God rich. He did it all, but He made Himself rich by drawing me into His family, by including me in His home, by including me as one of His sons and one of His daughters. I, the one who wasted His wealth on wantonness in the world. On that last sentence in red, uh, sorry, it got cut off, but listen to this. It's not what you do, but whose you are that makes you precious. Let me say that again. It's not what you do, but whose you are that makes you precious. You are a gift to the body of Christ. You know, in a lot of churches, when you go to the church, what they want to know is, what can you do? Oh, you're a talented musician. Sure, we need somebody who can play the drums or somebody that can do this. Are you a good banker? We need an accountant. Are you good at this? We need somebody to do that. Oh, yes, think of how we can expand our ministry because we've, we're drawing on this talent. These are how, this is how the corporations of the world are built. But the body of Christ is built like a family where when my children were born into my family, I wasn't already thinking, okay, now which one of you is going to do the dishes tonight? In fact, if you come into my home, the most important person in the home is usually the youngest. And Daphne's at about the age where she realizes it too. So she acts like it. But the children, the littlest one, always gets the attention. I mean, who cares about dad and mom? I want to see the baby. And if there's a new baby, even more. I want to, I want to hold the baby. This is exciting. This is how it is in a family. It's not about what you do and what you will do. Don't be so focused on what gift God has given you or not given you. Don't compare yourself with others and don't worry about what ministry you're going to have or not have. Remember this, you are valuable in your father's sight just because he is your father. It's not what you do, but whose you are that makes you precious. You are the gift to the body of Christ. In the next slide, rejoice because you are redeemed. Rejoice 
because you are redeemed. See, this is the gospel is called a gospel of it's great new it's good news of great joy. Good news. Remember, remember the, the angels came down and told the shepherds, I bring you the gospel. Good news of great joy. And sadly, the gospel has been twisted by legalistically minded people, by Pharisees, by people who are interested in laying heavy burdens on people without lifting a finger to help them. Turn this gospel into a gospel of, yes, forgiveness of sins and living holy and all of that minus the joy. And a gospel that presents holiness or righteousness minus the joy is a false gospel. I'll tell you that. A gospel that presents holiness, the holiness of God, without joy is a false gospel. What is your heaven like? When you imagine going into the gates of heaven, what do you imagine? Do you hear laughter? I'm starting to think so. I'm starting to think I'm going to hear the laughter of children. And joy, because you know it says in Psalm 16 verse 11, in His presence is overflowing joy. When you get nearer to the gates of heaven, what you'll find filtering out from heaven, which is not really more than the place, the presence of God. As you get closer to the presence of God, you know the test that you're getting closer to God, you're tasting more of that joy. You're hearing the laughter. You're hearing the joy that, is, that, that overflows from the throne of God, the source of joy, the giver of all joy. What is your heaven like? You know, it says in that parable in Matthew 25 that I have quoted there, you know, when he, and when he gives a commendation to the first two slaves for investing their, uh, what he gave them, he says, enter into what? Somebody tell me. Enter into the joy. This is the purpose. This is why those first two slaves did something with what the Lord had given them and the third didn't. The reason the third slave was a wicked, lazy slave because he says, you're a hard master. There's no joy in serving you. Yeah, you've given me one. Look at my lot in life. It's just one. There's no joy. Do you know why the other two did something with their five and something with their two? Because their eyes were fixed on the joy set before them. And finally he said, your eyes were fixed on the joy. Enter into it. You know how you will, what heaven is made for? Who is heaven made for? For those who have been fixed on the joy. Not only in their own lives, but in the way they interact with others. That as people spend time with you, and this is, you know, I, I, I'll tell you how the Lord's been speaking to me. Even this morning as I was sitting there thinking about how I'm going to speak this message, the Lord said, smile more even while you're speaking. Just smile. I mean, just let, not, not in a manufactured way, but let, if you're really experiencing that joy inside, let it be manifest in a way that people enjoy being around you. Jesus was one of the funnest people to be around. I believe with all my heart. He was, you know, he wasn't popular. He wasn't gifted at throwing a football or catching a football or doing any of the things that the world considered big in his day. But he was the funnest person to be around because he was full of joy. That's why even the children would come and sit on his lap and they loved to play with him. And the Pharisees and the legalistically minded disciples said, get away from him. This is an important person. You can get his autograph maybe, but don't waste too much of his time. And Jesus said, no, let them come. Because I want them to taste of this joy. And like Reese brought out in what he shared, it must be that our children are so infected, so infected, I use that word intentionally, with the joy that permeates out of our lives, with the laughter that happens in our homes and happens in our gatherings here and in our fellowship downstairs, where I love that fact. I mean, sometime do this when you go down for lunch. Just stop for a moment and shut out all you know, the conversation that you're in. And it's going to be really loud, but listen to the laughter. There's a lot of laughter. That's a sign of family. The family that laughs together stays together. I believe that. You know, you can be super spiritual and think, yeah, the, the family that prays together stays together. That can be a little bit super spiritual. Where you, all of a sudden you're making it about prayer. And you better pr you make sure we pray because we're going to stay together. I believe prayer will hold us together. And that's why we pray individually and collectively as a church. But when we laugh together, it means that we have entered into that relationship with each other where we're experiencing the presence of God in our midst, where there is fullness of joy. And we're comfortable and we're willing to overlook annoyances and laugh even at ourselves. When somebody makes a joke about me, I can laugh at it and think, this is family. I'm willing to enjoy the moment because somebody else is enjoying it. This is family. When I can laugh with the others, like he says in 1 Corinthians 12. You know what he's talking about in that context where we rejoice 
with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. The body of Christ. Read it sometime. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 onwards. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice, even though everything within my bones would say, don't rejoice right now. And then I hear the Holy Spirit and my Father in heaven calling me to a life that transcends my circumstance. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I'm going to end there. I have more next time. Amen.